Good morning, everyone. We're happy you're here. Uh, we just want to ask you, if you want, you can stand up, and we're going to begin praising the Lord. to him for the lord is a great god a great king above all gods he holds in his hands the depths of the earth and the mightiest mountains the, the sea belongs to him for he made it his hands form the dry land too come let us worship and bow down let us kneel before the lord our maker for he is our god we are the people he watches over the flock under his care as we sing this next song declaring the greatness of our god may you reflect in your heart and mind the ways god has been good and faithful to you let us sing together
man. You may be seated. I want to invite ushers to come forward and say good morning. Welcome. Glad you're joining us this morning. Uh, we're going to move into worship through giving of a tithe or offering. And I just want to say that uh, we do this not out of obligation. We do this out of uh, obedience, of submission to, the, to our Lord Jesus. And so we should do this with a cheerful heart. And uh, don't feel obligated, but do this because you're doing it out of faith in submission to the Lord. So let's pray. God, uh, as we have sung together, uh, you have great mercy for us. You are great. Your name is above every name. Uh, you are worthy of all our praise. And now, God, as we uh, give a portion back uh, uh, to you, what you've entrusted to us, to steward, may we do it with a cheerful heart, um, not out of obligation, um, but that we do it out of faith with thanksgiving. And I pray that uh, what's, what we offer uh, to your church, that it may be multiplied and used for the work of your kingdom, that more people would come to know your great name, your great grace, and your great mercy. And pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Bless you, friends. As the ushers are kind of finishing up, uh, we're going to uh, dismiss kids. So uh, the nursery age and elementary age, you guys are upstairs. And the three to five-year-olds, you guys are downstairs. Um, the rest of y'all can go ahead and uh, take a moment to say hello to those around you if you haven't yet. Um, if you're joining online, go ahead and text somebody hello. And we'll join back together in just a couple minutes. All right, if you can find your seat. Um, I have a couple of things to say. Um, one thing I want to say right from the get-go, because we seem to be having issue. We've been struggling a little bit with our live streams. Uh, I don't know why, but for whatever reason, there's just been some glitches that have been happening. A couple Sundays ago, we just didn't have any volume at all, and so that service just isn't online, so I apologize. Um, so 
know that we are trying our best, so it seems like it's not even on YouTube right now. I don't know what's going on. Uh, I don't know. It will be posted after the fact. Know that I try to do, do my best. If it doesn't work out on Sunday morning, I try and get it on there at the very latest on Monday morning. So I just wanted to mention that because we've been consistently kind of having problems. So it's not you. It's not your fault. YouTube isn't doing something to you. For some reason, it doesn't like us. Um, so I don't know why. Anyways, okay, so we have, I have a couple things. Uh, one, we, we have a part-time job available to, to clean a couple buildings um, on our campus. So uh, many of you know we have people here in and out of the buildings on a weekly basis, um, sometimes on a daily basis. And uh, so it's very vital to have our buildings clean. So this is a part-time job to help keep our buildings clean. A couple of them, this building, and I believe our the preschool building. So I think those are the two buildings that are available. If you or someone you know uh, wants some part-time work, uh, the hours are super flexible, basically whenever you have time. So if you have uh, time and you want some extra hours to make a little money, then uh, please let us know. Stop by the office Monday through Thursday, pick up an application or give us a call, email, text, do something, send a pigeon. Um, so uh, the, the other thing is that... Uh, we uh, are in desperate need of, of child care volunteers. So uh, as you, you can tell and you can feel, there's a lot of children that leave when we dismiss kids. And so we have a pretty, e- we're going back to a really easy sign up. It's right by the child check-in, which is just out the double doors and to the right. So if you are willing to, to watch kids in nursery or the, the preschool age, even for just a week, um, if all of us volunteered once, we could cover like three years. Um, So, uh, hey, you know, I'll do it once every three years. Well, if we all do it, then maybe. Um, So uh, I I doubt that's going to happen very seriously. But but if really, if you uh, would be willing to volunteer to help uh, take care of children during our services, um, that sign up is out there in the hallway. And then the last thing is just our prayer first posture. I want to continue to put this in front of front of you guys. We want to be a people of prayer. I want to invite you every Sunday morning at 9.30 to, to meet with a group of people up and upstairs, and um, they pray for uh, all kinds of things, things happening in your own life, in uh, our church, in our community, in our world. And so uh, engage with that, pray with other people. Also, if you have prayer requests, fill out a card in front of you, drop it in the box in the back that says prayer for his posture, or you're always welcome to call, email, text the church office. We will get those uh, prayer requests, or you can fill out our prayer requests online. We see those, we pray for you. We want to know what's going on in your life. So we're going to continue our series in the book of 1 Peter this morning, and we're going to be in the second part of chapter 2. Last week, I mentioned that the first part of chapter 2 that we went over um, was kind of the ending or the wrapping up of the doctrinal theological statements made by Peter. Really what that is, is just he's making foundational statements about what we believe and why we believe it. And now the section we're going to move into next is really practical Christian living. And so if you pay close attention, you can see how Peter makes a shift in his language that he uses. And this section that we're gonna be in today deals with the very weighty subject of submission. Submission. I've got a picture to show you. When I was a kid, when I was a kid, I wrestled a lot with my brothers, whether I wanted to or not. Now that's not me or my brother, but if it would be, if it was, I'd be the one in white, and Ross, if you don't know Ross, he plays the drums, uh, he would be the one in blue, and he would be the one putting me in a submission hold, right? Now, submission hold, and what you can't see is that the dude's legs are wrapped around the guy's body, and his legs are probably like curled up, and he can't breathe, and I've been there so many times <laughs> against my will. I wrestled a lot growing up with my brothers, and and... You know, often for a long time, Ross was just bigger than me. And so he'd play with me a little bit and then he'd just get me in a place where he's like got me in a headlock or he's got my body contorted or something like that. I think his favorite one was he put my knee to my forehead and then I'd just be like stuck there. And it's like, I can't breathe. I can't move. Let me out, right? Hence the name submission. 
submission hold, right? And his whole goal was to get me to tap out or submit to him, right? And uh, whether we, uh, when we think about submission, I think often we think of submission in this way, where somebody is exercising power and will over us and, and they want us to tap out, to submit, right? And I think uh, in wrestling in its most basic form is two people trying to impose their power on each other, right? They're trying to get one another to submit, right? And, and they'll do anything that they can within the legal bounds and submission holds, lots of them are within the legal bounds. I don't know if that's legal or not, but I've definitely been in that. That's happened before. Ross can attest to that. You jerk. No, I just can't. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. <laughs> oh. Brothers, okay? We love each other, I promise. But uh, I think wrestling is a really good metaphor for how so many people view the world. Because so many people view the world on a, a, as a, a spectrum of power. And there's power dynamics at play with everything that we do, right? And you're either exercising power over someone or you're having power being exercised over you. And this is how so many people view the world. It's certainly how the world operated in the first century when Jesus was establishing his church. And I believe it's much of how the world operates today, where we are trying to exercise power over one another. We're trying to impose our will to get other people to submit so that we can have authority. Right? And that's, that's kind of the, the dynamic that our world operates on. You can see it in to, so many years of life, in, in politics, in sports, in uh, relationships within families, siblings. There's so many relationships and, and, and ways in which people are exercising power over another and trying to hold on to it and trying to make sure that they don't have their power usurped by someone else. But here's the thing, though. God's kingdom, God's kingdom doesn't work this way. In God's kingdom, the act of submission, willingly putting yourself under one's authority, will bring life and flourishing. Submission is the way of the kingdom, not power. Not exercising your will to dominate another person. And so we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about submission. And I will say I've wrestled with this a lot. This section of scripture is challenging. And so uh, prepare to be challenged. This is challenging for me. This is a challenging word. And it's probably going to cause you to have to think some new thoughts. That's good. If we approach scripture and we never have to think new thoughts, if we never are challenged, we're not reading it correctly or we're skipping parts, right? So uh, this is challenging. Here's your warning. We're gonna pray and then we'll jump into 1 Peter chapter two. God, as uh, we come to this passage of scripture, this letter that Peter wrote to the early church, I pray now as we consider the idea of submission, what that means in your kingdom, I pray that you would speak to us, Holy Spirit, in ways that we can understand. Help us to yield to your truth and what you have to say through your word. Not just what I say, but use me, speak through me. May, may the hearts and minds in this room uh, not hear my words, but hear your voice, Holy Spirit pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to do something I don't normally do. Uh, we're going to actually start from the ending part of this section of, this, of the scripture in verse 21, and then we'll jump back up to verse 11 after a little bit. And the reason is uh, because I think the ending part is really good justification for the beginning part, and I think it will be helpful for us. So Verse 21 of chapter two, we'll come back up and read verse 11 through the end of the chapter in a little bit. So you can follow on the screen or in your own Bibles. Here we go. First Peter chapter two, verse 21. For you were called to this because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He did not commit sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was insulted, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. 
He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So Peter says here, he's, he's, Christ is our example. Christ, the way he lived, what he went through is what we should do. We should emulate him. And Jesus didn't deserve his mocking, his slandering, his beating, his crucifixion. Jesus was mistreated by the people who were in power of his day, the religious leaders and the political leaders, to the point of being put to death. And he didn't fight this. He didn't argue. He willingly gave himself. And he did this so that we could be made righteous through the death and the resurrection. And God has uh, made us right with himself through Jesus Christ, his son. And now we can live in his kingdom as new citizens and we can be changed. And Jesus is our example. You see, Jesus is not operating on the same power dynamics that the religious leaders and Pilate, the Roman governor, were operating on. Right? The world that we live in that operates on these power dynamics where we're trying to impose ourselves onto other people. Right? That's not Jesus. He's not doing this. God's way is not about imposing your will upon another person in order that they would submit to you. Right? God is not standing with whips and people under his thumb saying, do what I say or else. That's not God. God desires for us to willingly submit to him and then to others. I believe that is precisely the example Jesus is giving us by going to the cross. I want you to listen to what Jesus says to Pilate after being arrested. This is John chapter 18, I'll start in verse 33. Then Pilate went back into the headquarters, summoned Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, are you asking this on your own or have others told you about me? I am not a Jew, am I? Pilate replied, your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom is not of this world, said Jesus. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. You are a king then, Pilate asked. You said that I am a king, Jesus replied. I was born for this and I've come into the world for this, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. What is truth, said Pilate. And after he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I found no grounds for charging him. This exchange between Pilate and Jesus is fascinating. And it's very telling of how God's kingdom works, right? Here's Pilate. He's a Roman governor. He's minding his own business. And all of a sudden he gets thrust into his courtroom, a guy named Jesus. And he's being accused of being a king by his countrymen, the Jewish religious leaders. You see, the religious leaders believed that Jesus was a, a blasphemer. He spoke uh, wrongly about God and he was trying to lead people astray or so they thought. And he was gaining power and influence and his teaching was amazing, unlike anyone had ever heard. And he was performing miracle after miracle. And so many people kept flocking to Jesus that the religious leaders thought that the power that they had was about to be usurped. The power that they had over people in the temple to, to enact religious law and order was about to be overthrown because Jesus was just getting too popular. But you see, the religious leaders had no grounds to execute Jesus because of blasphemy. Even though they believed that's why he needed to be put to death, they had no grounds to do it. In the Roman Empire, they didn't have the power to actually execute somebody for a religious reason. So even though they saw their problem as being religious, they turned to Pilate and said, hey, he's claiming to be a king. That's right, he's claiming to be a king. They've turned this religious issue 
where they're going to lose power into a political issue where Jesus is now all of the sudden claiming to be the ultimate authority of the land. No, 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 you can't do that. You can't do that. And so they hand Jesus over to Pilate to do the dirty work of putting him to death. Pilate then asks Jesus this question. Are you in fact the king of the Jews? Are you king of the Jews? And his answer is so telling. It's so important for us to understand how his kingdom works and how we should see ourselves in the world. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight, but my kingdom is not from here. My kingdom is not of this world. Now, you, Pilate, you have soldiers at your beck and call. You have Roman legions that you could call into action any time you need to put somebody under the thumb of Rome. That's not how my kingdom works. My kingdom works differently. Jesus says, listen, if that's how I wanted to operate, if that's what I really was trying to do, overthrow this government by, by power and a military uh, campaign, I would have done that, but I haven't. Jesus is pointing to the fact that his kingdom, his rule, his authority, his expectation, his truth is not the same as Pilate or the religious leaders. The truth that Pilate knows and he understands deeply is one of power. It's power. I'm gonna exercise it over you before you get me. And I'm gonna do whatever I need to do to keep you under my power and authority. Talk about the Roman Empire. That was ingrained and embedded in their entire society, not just in the authorities, but even in, in, in relationships with, with common people. It was embedded, this power struggle You're either exercising power over someone or it's being taken from you and you don't want to be the latter. Jesus' truth is different. It's about sacrificially giving ourselves to others out of love. You don't win by dominating others. You win by giving yourself to them out of love. You win by trusting God who has great love for you as a father. You win by trusting that God is the one who judges justly and he will carry out the appropriate acts when is necessary. Peter says that this is what Jesus did in verse 23 of of chapter two. He says, when he was insulted, he being Jesus, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. The way of the kingdom is not a power struggle. It's one of submission. First and foremost, we submit ourselves to God and we trust him completely. And secondly, we submit ourselves to those around us out of love and reverence for God, out of service, following the example set before us by Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is important because this is a great paradigm shift that we all need to make as followers of Jesus. Right, We can look at the world around us and we see the power that people try and exercise. Even in simple things like go to a crowded parking lot. Go to a crowded parking lot and drive around. You don't even have to speak to that person, but there's a power dynamic at play. I'm gonna get this spot. No, you're not. I'm gonna nudge in there. Right? We, this is our world. And Jesus is saying, that's that's not my kingdom. That's not how my kingdom works. And if we are following Christ in this life, we, we need to make this shift away from playing power dynamic games to following Jesus' example of submission out of sacrificial love. That's a hard truth to swallow because it's easy to get caught up in these games of exercising power, of getting people to submit to you because I have the authority. But if we are to make 
Jesus, the cornerstone of our lives, as we talked about last week, which is a foundation of our faith, then we have to make this shift, all right? We have to. By God's grace and the Holy Spirit working on our hearts and our minds, we have to. So with that in mind, and I realize that's a lot to chew on. We could, I could pray right now, we could stop and go home because you could chew on that for the rest of your life. Um, and, I, and you should, you should chew on that. That, that. that God's kingdom works just differently than the way our world works. There's brokenness and corruption all throughout it. And, and we, as followers of Jesus, are called to live in a different way. Now, I want to go back to verse 11. Because this is, this is, with all of that in mind, with this paradigm shift that you should be thinking of now, that the kingdom of God works by submitting ourselves to him and then to others. Let's read verse 11 through the end of the chapter, okay? Here we go. Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day he visits. Submit to every human authority because of the Lord, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to the governors as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. Submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves. Honor everyone, love the brothers and sisters, fear God, honor the emperor. Household slaves, submit to your master with all reverence, not only to the good and gentle ones, but also to the cruel. For it brings favor if, because of a consciousness of God, someone endures grief from suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if, when you do wrong and are beaten, you endure it? But when you do what is good and you suffer, if you endure it, this brings favor with God. And now to what we read already. For you were called to this, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He did not commit sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was insulted, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Now, Peter begins this section, this practical living section, Christian living, by restating something he already said in verse one. And if you remember to verse one, he called them exiles in the land. Exiles. And he says again in verse 11, He says that you're exiles, you're strangers in the land, you're foreigners, meaning the place that you reside. Right here, I'm pretty sure none of you flew in from another country. Everybody in the United States, if you're a follower of Jesus, your primary citizenship is not to the United States. You're a stranger, you're an exile, you're a foreigner, because in Christ, you're a citizen of heaven. In Christ, you're a citizen of heaven. We have a new king, or to put it in our language, we have a new president. We have a new ruler. We have an entirely new form of government, if you will. And at the head of it is Jesus. Jesus' kingdom is not found in temples. It's not found in in church buildings. It's not found on mountaintops. It's not found in the rivers. It's found in people who willingly submit and surrender to his will and calling for their lives. It's found in his people. That's his kingdom. Peter wants to make sure that we understand 
this groundbreaking shift that needs to happen in the lives of everyone within the church. And this is groundbreaking, right? I, I, I set up this whole paradigm shift that we need to make. That's part of it. From power to submission and love. We live as people in the world with our priority and allegiance lying with Jesus and his kingdom first and foremost. With Christ as our cornerstone, being guided by his teaching and his example. And then Peter tells us to to do two things, really. To conduct ourselves honorably and then to submit to those around us. So verse 12, he says, conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles. That could also be translated pagans, people who are non-Christians, who either like don't believe in God or they believe something other on another paradigm than Christianity. So conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles. As followers of Jesus, we represent Christ to the world around us. The church is the witness of the kingdom. So how do we live honorably in our world? How do we do that? Well, there's a number of things that we ought to be doing to live honorable Christian lives. To be a witness of the kingdom in our increasingly more pagan world. Right? I think we can agree to that, that our world is, seems to be becoming more and more pagan. That's not the word that people use, um, but you know, any number of adjectives more spiritual or atheistic or whatever. It's pagan. So how, what, what, what should we be doing to live honorably? Well, here's some things. There's scripture to back all this up and we can talk about that later. But uh, if, if, if we read all the scripture, we'd be here for a couple hours. So we ought to be honest and full of integrity. We ought to be honest and full of integrity. Christians should be the most trustworthy, dependable people that walk this earth. We should be honest. We should be full of integrity. We ought to be humble people. Jesus' teaching of it's better to serve than to be served is about humility. It's better to serve others than to be served. Humble yourself. He got down and he washed his disciples' feet right? That's our example. That's not just for one person. It's not just for the pastor or the leader. It's it's for everyone. It's all of our example to humbly submit ourselves to others. We ought to lead in forgiveness and reconciliation as we recognize that Christ has forgiven us much. As we recognize that we, we don't have any grounds to have life or, or have salvation And yet Christ has given it to us because he's uh, given us forgiveness. So we ought to lead in forgiveness and reconciliation, restoring relationships as best as we are able, living at peace with others. We ought to be seeking justice with compassion as Christ called us to care for the poor, the orphan, and the widow. We ought to see people who are in states that are marginalized or destitute and and not look at them with uh, scoffing, but see them as human beings made in the image of God and look on them with compassion and say, how can we help? How can we see justice be served in the name of Jesus? We ought to be prayerfully dependent upon God. This fits hand in glove with humility realizing we have no ability to do anything that is good apart from the grace of God. It is by his grace alone that we can do good in this world. And so we ought to be prayerfully dependent upon him. And probably the most important, certainly Jesus said they were, we ought to love God with our entire being and love our neighbors as ourselves. Jesus said the greatest commandment and the second is like it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Right? These are things that we ought to be doing to conduct ourselves honorably in the world. That's a tall order. Maybe you don't come by being honest very easily. Maybe you're not very compassionate. Maybe you're not really good at forgiving people. But the thing is, is that when we do these things well, we represent Christ and his kingdom well. And here's the wonderful thing about good Christian conduct is that none of this happens because you just try hard enough. No, no, no. 
God's grace is sufficient for you. The things that you struggle with, that you need help with most, God's grace is sufficient for you. By the power of the Holy Spirit living with inside of you, to work on your heart and your mind, you can be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can conduct yourselves in an honorable way. So by the power of the Spirit dwelling within us, we can put off our sinful behavior and we can live favorable, honorable Christian lives. We can be people of integrity, of honesty, of humility, of love. Then Peter tells us to submit. First, he says, submit to every human authority because of the Lord. Every human authority. And really what Peter's saying to use our language is submit to the government. Submit to the authorities placed above you to to carry out law and order in our society so that we don't have anarchy. That's what the government is for what they should be doing. Um, Sometimes uh, things get messy because life is messy. The government sticks their hands in things maybe they shouldn't be. But that's a conversation for uh, another day. Um, Ultimately, we submit to authority because this will honor and serve God. How does submitting to an authority honor and serve God? Well, Ultimately, whether the authority figure recognizes it or not, they've been given that authority by God. And they will have to answer for everything that they did exercising their authority over others, whether it be good or evil. Right? They will have to answer for everything that they did. And again, Peter says that our example, Jesus, he trusted that God was going to judge justly in the end. God is going to judge justly. And the thing that we, what we don't like about that is that we want justice served right here and now. And sometimes we don't understand the bigger picture and justice is going to be served in the end and not right here and now. Sometimes it's flip-flopped. Sometimes justice is served now. And we say, glory to God. And other times we just have to trust God, you are sovereign over this situation. Just like Jesus trusted and willingly gave himself up for us on the cross, we have to trust, we have to submit and say, God, you are ultimately in control. We know you have sovereignty over the situation. You see the bigger picture and I know that you have justice in mind. You will serve justice, whether it's here and now or whether it's in the life to come. We have faith that you will do it. And of course, our world is full of corruption. It's full of broken people. And it's operating on this power dynamic that we talked about. And, and this power dynamic is palpable in, in the day and age that Peter is writing this letter. And it seems strange then to think that, why would Peter say submit to governmental authorities when like, you look at the governmental authority and it seems obvious that there's corruption and, and evil going on. Right? And yet I doubt very seriously that the Roman Empire somehow has moral high ground compared to our modern U.S. government. I study the Roman Empire a little bit. I think we're, I think we're in a little bit better situation than, than they probably were. And yet Peter still says to submit. Why? Because it's out of honor and serving God. I want to hone in on verse 17. There's these short statements made. Honor everyone, love the brothers and sisters, fear God, honor the emperor. Right? Honor everyone, love brothers and sisters, fear God, honor the emperor. I think these short statements are important for us when considering submission. Okay? Let's first talk about fearing God. Fearing God is a theme found all throughout the Bible. And it's often tied to this idea of worship or reverence of God. The way that I would describe fearing God is like this. To fear God is to acknowledge God's immeasurability while acknowledging how finite and small you are. That's how I would put it. 
But to fear God is to recognize God's immeasurability in everything possible while acknowledging how finite and small you are. It's to recognize and have a healthy sense of awe and terror that God could at any moment do anything. That should should terrify us in a very healthy way. Recognizing that we didn't put this into motion. I didn't knit you in your mother's womb and you didn't knit me in my mother's womb. And God did that. Not just for me, but for you and the people sitting next to you and the people out there and the people around the world. And he holds our world together on it seems like a a, a razor's blade that if any one thing was tweaked just a little bit, the whole world would fall apart, it seems. But that, that's, that's God's immeasurability that we can't possibly wrap our minds around and we need to have a healthy fear of him out of awe and respect. And only God should be feared in this way. This is different than honoring everyone and honoring the emperor. Now, I believe that you honor people by acknowledging that they're made in the image of God and that they're loved by him. That whether they recognize it or not, Christ died for them. To honor people is to realize that they have dignity and worth just by the nature of them being a human. Right? Whether, whether they're on the same team as you, whether they agree with you or not, To honor somebody is to recognize you're made in the image of God. You have dignity and worth and value simply because of that. That's different still to loving the brothers and sisters. Now, in Greek, there's many different words for love. And this word for love here is agape. And I know a lot of you know this this word for love. Agape is the deepest sense of love that is meant to convey uh, intimacy and affection for someone. Agape is the kind of love that uh, the Father and, and Jesus, the Son, are described as having towards us. And we are meant to have this agape kind of love for brothers and sisters. Who are brothers and sisters? It's everybody who follows Jesus. Right? We're called the family of God. The people who follow Jesus are our brothers and sisters. So I said all these statements are important for considering submission. Here's why I believe that to be the case. I think they should be ranked in in an order. First, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit alone is to be feared. All of our submission starts there. All of our submission starts there. We don't fear anybody on earth or any entity on earth like we are meant to fear God. All of our submission starts with Jesus as King, Jesus as Lord. The second thing, we're to love our brothers and sisters or our fellow followers of Jesus with this this agape type love. This goes beyond simply honoring somebody and recognizing they're made in God's image and they have worth and value and dignity. This goes beyond and says, I love, I care for you. I wanna submit to you out of service, out of sacrifice for your betterment. And then the third thing is we honor everyone and the emperor. Now, Peter doesn't necessarily rank these statements. Like it's not written as a one, two, three in scripture. And he doesn't even put them in the order that I'm suggesting that they should be. But I believe the language he uses suggests suggests this order. That there's an importance here that is kind of a tip of the hat to how we deal with submission when things get messy and gray. And who knows things get messy and gray? Life gets messy. Right, Because the minute I say submit to everyone or submit to the government, you're probably thinking, well, what happens if they ask me or require me to do something that violates me submitting properly to Jesus? And to that, I would say, fear God, love your brothers and sisters, and honor the government. Right? We, can't, we can't mess that order up. God has to be first. Right? And there were even times in the early church when Peter and the apostles, they were told, stop preaching about Jesus. Don't do it. And they simply replied, we need to be obedient to God, not man. Which 
at face value would seem to contradict exactly what Peter's telling us to do. I don't think so. I think it's just an exception. It's an exception to the rule. And it's important to also note how Peter and the rest of the apostles um, went against the authority in, in, in this, these instances. Their response was not to uh, start fights or riots. They didn't slander the authorities. They didn't speak ill of the people who were trying to enact power over them um, as being the people in the government, if you will. Uh, they just simply said, we need to be obedient to God. We're not going to do what you said. We're going to continue to do what our Lord calls us to do. To preach Christ crucified, Christ risen from the grave. And often they were arrested, they were beaten, they were mocked, and they were even killed. But they did so following the example Jesus set before us, trusting that God ultimately would bring justice. Fear God, love the brothers and sisters, submit to the government. If, for whatever reason, your brothers and sisters or the government tell you to do something that would violate you submitting to God, you go with God every single time. Every time. I think that's what Peter's trying to convey here. You don't fear the government the way you fear God. You don't, you don't fear people the way that you fear God. Our submission starts with him to Jesus as King and Lord. Now, then we get to this part in the middle about slaves because uh, this whole section of scripture is really easy. Um, <laughs> slavery is a topic that uh, is really uncomfortable I know I've heard from a lot of people, why doesn't the Bible just say outright flat? Slavery is wrong and evil and bad. There we go. There it is. Well, unfortunately, I've yet to find that scripture in the Bible, okay? And uh, slavery is a huge topic. We don't have nearly enough time to get into it at this point. Um, but I want to say a couple things. First, people will point to sections of scripture like this that are addressing slaves or masters or sometimes both and say, see, the Bible is pro-slavery. It's pro-slavery. And, and this is the grounds that they, they use to make such a claim. The problem with that is if you read these passages, if, we, if you read this again, Peter addresses the household slave, tells him to submit to his master, whether the master's good or evil. Submit because you're doing this out of honor, out of reverence for God. And never in there does Peter say, because this is a good institution, honor and submit to your master. Right? Nowhere do I think the Bible says uh, or promote that slavery is a moral or ethical good thing. But it certainly addresses it more times than a lot of people are comfortable with. And I think that's fair. Fair enough. It makes me uncomfortable. Probably should make you uncomfortable too. But here's the thing. I think the Bible is not condoning slavery. I think it's merely acknowledging that there are people in this serious reality. And all throughout the ancient world, in fact, for most of all of human history, slavery is a thing. And we think it's gone today. It's not. It's still around Slavery still exists. People are still uh, owning people and trafficking people. It's tragic. It's not a good thing. And I don't think you can use the Bible to say that it is. I think rather what Peter is doing is acknowledging the reality for a large portion of the Roman Empire. All right? We don't have an exact number, but 10 to 20% of the population of the Roman Empire were slaves. 10 to 20%. That's a lot of people. And Paul addresses uh, slaves and masters. Peter addresses slaves. And what I think they are doing is trying not to leave out a portion of people who have come to Christ. There are people who were slaves and who were slaveholders who found Jesus and were trying to follow him as best as they could. And by Peter not acknowledging them would be to ignore part of the church. 
And I think that would probably have been a misstep. So slavery is, is, it makes us uncomfortable. It's hard. But here, um, I don't think it's pro-slavery. I don't think it's uh, saying it, it's against slavery necessarily. It's just simply acknowledging that it exists. And I think all of us would say, yeah, it certainly does. Certainly does. And here's the thing too about this section that's hard is that at face value, it's like, well, none of us are slaves. So how does this pertain to me at all? Well, I don't think it's completely worthless. And here's why. All throughout this section, Peter tells us to submit and to do good. Submit and do good. Whether the people in authority treat you well or they treat you poorly, submit and do good. Jesus as our example, who didn't argue, he didn't fight back because his kingdom is built different. His kingdom is built on love and sacrifice, submission. There are times when we can do good and we can submit properly and we can live honorable lives and it won't go well for us. And we're called to live like Jesus. You're called to this because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example. You should follow in his steps. He did not commit sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When he was insulted, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Let's pray. Jesus, we recognize you as as King and as Lord. And I pray now through your grace and the power of the Spirit working on us, I pray that we will properly submit to you. That we would put you as the cornerstone of our life so that we can live an honorable life in the world around us. Help us not to forget where our citizenship lies, that we are citizens of the King, of you, Jesus. Help us to properly submit to you and then properly submit to others out of love, out of service. May we follow your example by your grace and with faith. Amen. Well, friends, uh, that, was a, that was a lot to chew on, a lot to process, and I know it's a little bit longer. Um, if you want to talk about more, man, I would love to talk about more. But for now, what I want to say is the Lord loves you. He has great, great things for you. And may we, in the grace of God, through the power of the Spirit, walk in those good things. You guys have a great week. You're dismissed.